and I'm going to call into order. I'd like to ask Claire to call roll. Len Erickson. Present. Dan Haggerty. Present. Barbara Mathewson. Present. Dave Olson. Present. Michelle Weil. Is she on leave? I think and she's still on leave. I guess so. Claire Tutat, I'm here. Okay, so very good. Form. Five minutes present. Thank you, Claire. Okay, um, apologies to all for uh, the little glitch in the startup, um, but I think we're, we're squared and we're here ready for the meeting. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go to public, uh, the supervisor's report. So, Carrie. Thanks, Len. Um, good evening, Midcoast Community Council members and community members. I'm Carrie Dolman here on behalf of Supervisor Don Horsley's office at San Mateo County. I have a couple of updates to share this evening. Um, the first one is about the Coastside Design Review Committee. Um, this is a county committee, and there are currently some ongoing vacancies. Um, for a little bit of background, the Coastside Design Review Committee has 13 members, including licensed architects or landscape architects, and also resident members from the following Midcoast communities, Montera, Moss Beach, El Granada, Princeton, and Miramar. Um, if this is something that anyone is interested in applying for, um, I will paste the vacancy notice in the chat box. And um, I encourage uh, anyone who's interested to check it out the opportunity. My second update is about the Tunitas Creek Beach Improvement Project. The San Mateo County Parks Department, along with agency partners, are continuing to work on this improvement project and they're beginning a public process asking for community feedback and input on what people would like to see for the future design of this park. It's going to be a new park um, added on to the San Mateo County Park System. So there's an online web page. Um, I'll paste the link in the chat and it's also one of the latest posts on the Midcoast Community Council website as well. And um, on that webpage, you can find more information about the status of the project, as well as a survey to provide any feedback that you may have. Um, those are all my updates for this evening, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. If anyone has questions, you raise your hand, please, on the Zoom. Okay, very good. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks. Okay. Next up is a public comment for anyone who would like to speak on an item that's not on the agenda. Uh, I believe I had one uh, message received from Greg Yegas. So, Greg, could you go ahead? Thanks, Len. Uh, can everybody hear me? I can hear you. We hear you. Okay. The first thing is, um, I realize the MCC is uh, trying to guide us through the process of commenting on several of the initiatives the county is doing, but I just wanted to take it a step further and ask if the MCC could commit to be kind of a uh, watchdog uh, gatekeeper so that residents know how, when, why, who, and how to comment in order to achieve standing on the various initiatives that are now underway. Uh, you may recall Erin Denziger uh, was disallowed standing in part because she didn't understand the protocol. And you're aware several of us have been involved in this, have spoken at other meetings, but we want to make sure that we get the right information to know when to talk to the Coastal Commission, the Board of Supervisors, or whoever we have to. So that's my first request. Secondly, there was talk of the MCC holding its own meeting, and I think this is a good idea. Uh, you've heard discussion before about how very long Zoom meetings at Monterra and the MCC were most informative because everybody could hear in real time what the other people were saying, in contrast to the breakout groups that were held for CTC, where, you know, at best you heard 30 minutes of other people in your room talking and you 
you don't have any idea what really went on the other sessions, except uh, they were lively discussions. So it's really a drawback not having that. Clara made a point, though, before we hold a meeting, we ought to have something specific to debate. And I agree with that. And my suggestion is that Lisa Ketchum has given us an excellent starting point for discussions. In other words, take what you like about the CTC and what you want to see adopted and have that proposed for the group to discuss and then forward that with our endorsement to the county. Um, so I'd welcome the MCC's action on having our own meeting, an open one. And then finally, I tripped over a, uh, a water uh, analysis done in 2010 for the county when they were looking at whether or not the Midcoast could support more build out. And you're aware we were drawing 3,000-year-old water at Monterra during the end of the last drought, and then the following wet weather years when the pipes burst in the sewer. So we're facing a climate change situation that increases the risks on both air, both ends of the spectrum. And I'm going to ask that we request the county do another such study before all this additional development because I do not believe that the water agencies have reserved water, especially in drought conditions. And I include Half Moon Bay in that as well. I'd like to see an independent assessment 10 years since the last one was done. You, you realize that these small agencies have every motivation to take all the connection fees and new users they can get, regardless of whether they have the water in drought conditions. And I don't believe they do. And I, I believe we need an independent assessment of whether their water is reserved for the build out or affordable housing. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Greg. Greg, on the first thing you mentioned, you spoke to wanting to know how to comment on things that sounded like it was a general statement as opposed to any particular item. Were you directing that toward any specific activity or just as a general statement? Well, as I wrote in the email, I'm directing it specifically to connect the coast side, Cypress Point, the LCP amendment. That may be three different things. That may be two and a half things. I'm not sure. Um, but you people are much more informed than the rest of us average residents. And I don't want us to miss the opportunity to be heard because we don't understand the nuances of bureaucratic protocol. Okay. And that's just on these items. If we wanted to take it as a long-term charter, the MCC fine but I'm focused on these things because they're massively important and have the potential for major disruption of life here on the mid coast. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Len. Uh, uh, yes, there. So there's a representative from half moon Bay waiting to speak. Uh, you're right. Thank you. Before we get uh, public, I go to the Harvey road back. <laughs> okay. Thanks Len. Um, Harvey Ryback speaking for the half moon Bay city council. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that there was a lot of concern and justifiable about what happened at Memorial Day. And we certainly didn't want a repeat of what happened on the beaches all along the coast side uh, during the July 4th uh, weekend. So we went into hyperdrive uh, trying to get the, the county, the state, uh, Caltrans, it went all the way up to Newsom. Finally, we got permission to uh, have all the beaches, all the parking lots closed. We kept the restrooms open. And I'm sure you saw that the traffic was immensely uh, better on this weekend and there were hardly anybody on the beach. We had uh, city staff at the entrances to some of the beaches, explaining <laughs> to people that all the beaches uh, and all the parking lots were closed. And I think it was a real success. So I think some lives may have been saved by the actions of all of these government committees uh, and agencies over the weekend. So that's my report, and I'm glad to answer any questions. <clears throat> okay. Anyone on the council with any questions for Harvey? Yes. Yes, go ahead, Claire. I just wanted to add that the uh, Sheriff's Department and the state also pitched in and made sure everything was safe, and I appreciate the county's action to do that. Okay. Yes, still your hand up, go ahead. Oh, okay. <clears throat> uh, Dave? 
Yeah, I just wanted to briefly uh, let everybody know in response to um, Greg's comment about all the other, go other government bodies that on the MCC website, again, midcoastcommunitycouncil.org, uh, underneath the contacts government links, we have links to just about every government organization that has anything to do with the coast side. Um, and on our calendar, we list the calendar meetings for every uh, organization that I can think of. If we're missing something, let me or somebody else know and we'll get it on there. Um, and as far as the protocols, they, they are different. They change over time. So it's best that anybody who wants to know the protocols for any given organization goes to those organizations' websites and or ask the body themselves. Okay. To uh, <clears throat> anyone else, <clears throat> to answer a, a point that uh, Greg did raise with respect to Cypress Point and the LCP amendment, the Planning Commission has, in their last meeting we mentioned, has approved and forwarded that amendment to the Board of Supervisors, and they're scheduled to hear that on the meeting on July 21st. If they vote to uh, recommend it, it will go forward to the Planning Commission for certification. So there's opportunity for comment to the Board of Supervisors, and then once it's with the Planning Commission, there'll be, op the, I'm sorry, the Coastal Commission, there'll be opportunity to come up there as well. And we'll have some further information about that on the website. But that's for individuals to comment. Excuse me, I don't understand how to use all this stuff, but when is the next Coastal Commission meeting for Northern California? And where is it? Dave, you're our best person to speak to that. The, the answer is the, the Coastal Commission meets on a regular monthly basis, but they meet at different locations throughout the state. Right, but... If I could chime in, they're, they're all virtual meetings at this point. And it's always on a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, Friday. once a month. Okay. Thank you. And with respect to example for the Cypress Point uh, amendment request, once that goes to their staff, they'll review it, and then at a future date, they'll announce when it will be on their agenda, but it would not be happening in this current next meeting or even after that, so, but we'll keep posted on that. Okay. Um, with no further public comment, do uh, any members have any announcements? I have a few. Claire, go ahead. Um, let's see, uh, the Community uh, Climate Action Plan is being revived. So, am I okay here? Go ahead. Okay, is being revived and they're going to be having upcoming uh, workshops for the public, especially for the mid coast to, um, put give input to the sustainability office about uh, priorities for community action on climate change um, also uh, the mcc was helpful in finding uh, uh, locations for voter centers for the november election there will be a, a voter section that serves montera and moss beach that will be open for a few days also one that serves El granada so that was a success and the census is doing better. Dave may know more about that than I do. Yeah, I haven't checked for a week and a half, but we did bump way up after the Census Bureau people went around uh, the mid-coast communities, uh, but still well below the rest of the county. There is another thing, which is regarding elections. The election center countywide is hiring people for the November election and uh, to, to do work leading up to it as well. It's uh, $21 an hour, so um, if you're interested, go to the county's election center website. That's all. Thank you, Claire. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay, next on so, the agenda. I, I do have one thing, Len. Since, ahead, since the election resolution is on consent, I will mm -hmm. announce that um, we will have two vacancies up for election on November 3rd. 
and uh, the period for filing is from, uh, I believe it's July 13th through August 7th. So if you're interested, uh, look at the, at the document that's on the MCC website and then go look at the county elections website. Thank you, Dave. By the way, no. may, I make a, may I make a correction in that listing? My name is once again smelt, spelt wrong. We will make sure it's spelled right. I, I don't know why that seems to be a problem, but it is. Okay. We'll make sure that's corrected. Okay. Yeah, in addition, there are actually uh, three vacancies on the council for the next election. Uh, council member Haggerty and council member Matthewson have their terms expiring and may run for re-election, but the, we'll be able, and then there is one vacancy. So there'll be three open seats for election. I think Dan is termed out. He's had two terms, hasn't he? Dan? But unaware of any term limitation. Two, two term limit. And Barbara Matthewson is not running for re-election. Okay. okay, thank you. So we have three items on the agenda. Yes, the uh, minutes for June 8th, minutes for June 22nd, and also the general election resolution for open openings in uh, the MCC for the November 3rd general election. Is someone trying to talk and there's a, not a good sound from it? Anyway, um, so it's open to a motion to accept the consent uh, agenda. I so move. I'll second. Thank you. Any comment before voting? Okay. Claire, could you call the roll? Dan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Dave? Yes. Lynn? Yes. And I vote yes, it's uh, five zero. Okay, thank you, Claire. Okay, <clears throat> we're, uh, we're moving ahead now to the regular agenda. Uh, the regular agenda today deals entirely with Connect the Coast side. As I mentioned in our last meeting, we wrapped up current comment with respect to Cypress Point. And our first item is some further information from Joe LeClaire. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. I think you're going to present your slides. Is that correct, Joe? Yes, thank you, Len. I'm just waiting to be able to share my screen with you all. Um, and I think Dave is busy setting that up right now. You should be able to do it now, Joe. Yeah, so good evening, um, Mid-Coast Community Council members and, and um, co-siders. My name is Joe LeClaire, Planning Manager with San Mateo County. And tonight I want to talk about the um, aspects of the Connect the Coastside plan we weren't able to cover in the virtual meetings, the um, delay index, some of the improvements on Highway 92, and the... Uh, um, um, let me see, is this going to work? My slides are not advancing. There we go. And the land use programs that are part of the, um, of the plan dealing with reductions in development potential on the coast side. Um, as well, we'll talk about um, the, uh, the next steps in the plan, but I wanna start with a brief summary of the uh, uh, virtual meetings that were just held. And I wanna thank my colleagues, Shonda Singh and uh, Katie Faulkner who helped me put this presentation together for you tonight. Um, so first we'll start out with a brief summary of the virtual meetings. As you know, we'll be, uh, preparing a report that outlines the um, uh, outcome of the meeting and our recommended responses to uh, to those to the input in in the way of um, 
of um, changes to the plan, but we had um, 132 attendees um, across the three meetings. We think there were about 100 uh, different people who attended. Some people attended several meetings. Um, so, um, and it was impossible to, to sort out exactly um, who attended each meeting, but but we do know that we had we had about 165 people register for the meetings, and so we obviously not everyone who registered came, but we had a good turnout. Um, the um, um, we have posted all the meeting um, presentations, the recordings of the meetings, and the uh, breakout room notes on our Connect the Coast side website. So all the uh, sort of raw data is there from which we will be uh, developing our summary report and the um, um, recommenda recommendations for changes to the plan. So what did we hear from the, from the public in these meetings? Um, first, we heard support for some of the initiatives in the plan. Um, the goals of the plan seem to resonate with most of the attendees. Um, and certainly the parallel trail was well liked by uh, most people. Um, there was a great deal of interest in seeing uh, uh, more modal options and particularly bicycle and pedestrian options like the parallel trail. Um, we also heard a lot of support and concern about um, neighborhood level projects to address speeding in the neighborhood. There's been um, apparently some increase uptick in uh, dangerous driving in some of the neighborhoods and overall there was wide, widespread support for that, that kind of uh, project. And uh, also better transit service, especially to rail stations like BART and Caltrain, as well as better uh, transit service to Half Moon Bay. Some of the concerns that we heard um, included that there was a lack of safe pedestrian crossings to State Route 1 and discontinuous infrastructure, in particular uh, bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure where sidewalks end uh, they're, or they're, they're either absent or discontinuous bike trails, that sort of thing. Um, there was concern about traffic congestion and, and difficulty turning on and off of State Route 1. And I think this is what we heard in the survey. Uh, paramount concern on the coast side is um, traffic congestion and, and that there needs to be something done about it. Um, also concern about lack of school buses and transit that makes it difficult for people to shift from driving. As the, we learned in the survey, many people um, have a uh, single occupancy vehicle or driving as their, their primary way of getting around. And so there's a need for more alternatives. And, um, and again, we heard again and again, the need to address emergencies, evacuation and safe routes to schools. So those are some, uh, and I'm just hitting the, some of the headlines here. We will, as I mentioned, the, the, um, the feedback that we got in the meeting is posted to our website and we will be posting a report um, in, to you in um, early August for the August uh, 10th meeting. So we're continuing our outreach. Um, yesterday, Katie Faulkner and, um, and others from the Office of Sustainability met with the, um, a youth group on the coast side to get their uh, input on um, transportation as, and we are uh, working on a Spanish speaker outreach. We have translated many of the materials produced into Spanish and we're working on a, um, what I believe will end up being a, a sort of a conference call um, or a series of conference calls um, with Spanish speakers to um, try to and reach out to that community. Uh, we're also, um, as I mentioned, preparing the summary report on the virtual meetings. And um, also the um, county manager's office is preparing and, and district um, and supervisor Horsley's office is preparing a report on listening to the mid coast surveys, a summary report of that um, effort. And 
we plan to then present the findings of this and our recommended changes to the plan on August 10th. So first I'd like to start with the um, State Route 92 recommended projects. Um, this map, which you may recognize from the fact sheets that are on the website, um, shows a summary of the improvements proposed for Highway 92, including pedestrian, um, bicycle, um, and roadway improvements. Um, and starting with some of the roadway improvements, the Connect the Coast side recommends roundabouts or intersection control at um, both intersections of Highway 35 and 92. So, whoops, I gotta go back there. Um, so, um, the original Connect the Coast side um, public, uh, proposals from 2016 included a um, roundabout at the lower um, intersection of Highway 35 and 92 to just improve uh, traffic flow there. And we also believe it will provide an important um, safe pedestrian crossing at that location. Um, the Crystal Springs uh, Recreational Trail is um, in place on both sides of Highway 92, but it lacks a safe uh, pedestrian crossing and reconfiguring that intersection would improve traffic flow there and it would also create a safe environment for pedestrian crossings. Now, this lower roundabout is not, um, necessary, is not necessary from a traffic perspective. In other words, the level of service at this intersection um, is adequate without it. But we believe that um, having people sit at the 35 light um, to turn on to 92 and, um, and, and the inability of pedestrians to cross safely would be greatly enhanced by um, having, a, having a roundabout there. Um, on the upper or western intersection, um, basically a build out, the projections show that a, uh, some kind of intersection control would be needed up here. We believe a roundabout would be a superior solution. We're unsure whether it will fit uh, because of the grades and the sight lines. So um, intersection control analysis would be necessary uh, to determine whether that would be a workable solution there. Moving on to other um, roadway and intersection improvements, we want to see left turn lanes at major businesses along State Route 92 in the unincorporated areas, um, as well as potentially climbing lanes between the quarry um, and the existing um, climbing lanes to uh, alleviate some of the westbound congestion, or excuse me, eastbound congestion on State Route 92. Um, those are very expensive because of the grading necessary and uh, potential environmental impacts, but they would alleviate that congestion eastbound be because of the slow trucks climbing the hill. Um, for pedestrian crossings, we see the need for um, crossings of Highway 92 at uh, points of interest in businesses. And, and I mentioned the recreational trails earlier. Um, I forgot to mention the Ridge Trail um, at, the, uh, at the summit there at the upper Highway 35, um, the uh, intersection with 92. The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is uh, releasing an EIR for a trail southbound from Highway 92 along Skyline. And they're also in the process of opening a trail north of 92 um, up to Sweeney Ridge. And we think that, you know, making these trail crossings safe is going to be a really important recreational amenity um, within the coastal zone. Also, we think these uh, pedestrian crossings should include uh, high visibility striping and pedestrian activated beacons to make them safe. Signage improvements include um, signs to uh, warn trucks to keep to the right uh, so that motorists can pass them and also uh, to improve the uh, safety of intersections by adding signs for drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists. Um, 
The um, bicycle circulation and safety improvements include uh, providing more safe for uh, more space for cyclists. And that could be done either by widening the shoulders or adding a bike lane or even a, um, a buffered or separated uh, bike bike route. Again, this this would be contingent excuse me, contingent on um, future demand studies, but also um, environmental considerations because the, the amount of grading and um, uh, impacts to uh, potential habitats along there would all have to be factored into um, whether or not such a bike lane would be possible. But we do believe that those kind of improvements would, would greatly enhance uh, mobility options along, along that corridor. Now I'd like to move into discussing the delay index, which is the new uh, standard proposed in Connect the Coast side for evaluating the performance of the transportation uh, system. So of course there are different ways to measure uh, transportation performance of transportation infrastructure. And currently the LCP includes a standard for level of service um, that is used for, it, it's, it's as the policy reads, it says it's to be used for determining when to widen um, Highway 1. Um, but it, it's used more broadly than that in terms of assessing um, intersection impacts and, uh, and performance of the roadway. And basically level of service is A through F similar to the grades you got in school. A is a good grade, F is a bad grade. And um, if, if you're operating in, in level of service, D, E, and F, you're in the a danger zone. So um, th that's the current most popular standard. Um, at, although the state has recently passed legislation requiring all um, jurisdictions to use vehicle miles traveled, as the CEQA standard for um, significance. So level of service can no longer be used in um, environmental documents and as a basis for a significant environmental impact based on transportation. So vehicle miles traveled assesses the um, traffic generated by a given, by the, the miles of, of vehicular travel generated by a given use or it's also, it can be a measure for total vehicle miles traveled in a given area. But generally speaking, um, you know, it's, it's that, that, that applies more to plans and um, vehicle miles traveled for um, projects is, is the just more common um, measure. And now the delay index is the, um, is the standard that we're proposing for um, Connect the Coast side. And um, Connect the Coast side is, is our measure for how well a roadway segment is performing. And it's defined as the ratio of peak period travel time on a corridor to free flow travel time, where peak period equals the weekday commute and weekend midday when traffic is really high. So what does that mean, the um, free flow versus um, you know, peak period travel? And, and when does a, a roadway segment become deficient um, using the delay index? So the proposed standard is that travel time along a vehicle segment with longer than two times uh, free flow travel time would be um, deficient. It would be you know, not performing to standard. So for example, if a five minute trip uh, during free flow becomes longer than 10 minutes during the peak, whether it's weekend or uh, during the um, weekday commute, then um, on, on any stretch of road, then that stretch of road would be deficient. And travel time along a multimodal segment. So if that's, that's a, a basically a roadway that has no bike lanes or, um, class one bike or, and pet or multimodal trail um, along it. And what Connect the Coast Side proposes is that for those segments of highway that have a multimodal um, 
corridor where you have both two lanes of travel in one in each direction and a either bike lanes on both sides or a class one trail um, beside which would by class one trail I mean at least you know 10 feet wide and adequate for uh, accommodating both cyclists and pedestrians um, in those in those quarters or those segments the three times free flow travel would be um, would be deficient and in a five minute trip again then taking longer than 15 minutes would mean that that segment is deficient so how does the um, coside measure up based after build out um, so and then and when I say build out I mean the 2040 development projection um, and and what this shows is that without any of the transportation projects in connect the coast side state route one southbound to uh, Murata Road would be deficient um, at the weekday p.m. peak because it would take longer than twice the um, free flow travel time to reach Murata Road and um, but all the other segments are um, n are not deficient um, according to that standard and the um, after mitigations the all the segments of both um, state route one and highway 92 um, are no longer deficient um, with the um, with with those interventions so now this standard let me see um, this standard let me back up a minute here this standard was developed um, in response to the um, level of service um, analysis that was done early in connect the coastside that showed that the only way to um, fix the uh, deficiencies was to widen the highway and the public made clear that they were not supportive of widening the highway and and the county wasn't wasn't really either because we weren't sure where we would find the money anyway and and it would preclude uh, many of the multimodal um, improvements it would usurp the right-of-way that's there um, and prevent the construction of um, the parallel trail um, it would also impact a number of habitats um, and have a pretty significant effect on the visual character of the coast side. So um, it was agreed that a, a, stand, a different standard was needed in order to uh, come up with a way to measure roadway performance um, in order to um, come up with a suite of projects that could um, generate acceptable delay, but greater delay than um, would be um, allowed under the level, current level of service standards. Um, so I'd like to now spend a minute talking about the uh, land use policy concepts that are in the plan. Um, and they include the lot merger program that would start out as voluntary and become mandatory, the lot retirement program and the transportation impact mitigation fee. So the coastside has a number of paper subdivisions at, at the margin of um, the um, El Granada and uh, Moss Beach where there are parcels that um, and streets that have never been fully accepted by the um, by the county, although they were approved by the county back in the teens and 20s. Um, um, and so we have um, revised the criteria for legalization of parcels, um, including with included in these historic recorded subdivision, um, and it requires a um, a CFC, and we estimate there are about 183 parcels that meet this um, uh, in in the uh, county's jurisdiction. Now we also um, have a new policy in the subdivision regulations that were adopted in um, 2017 that 
require that prohibits lots that do not meet minimum lot size or uh, lot width standards and require a CFCB, in other words, a certificate of compliance um, B, which is a discretionary uh, certificate of compliance, that those um, certificates would be issued with a requirement to record a acknowledgement that those, those lots cannot be developed. Um, that's not true for the uh, CFCAs, but those, um, so a, a certificate of compliance that, that meets the standards for um, an A certificate of compliance, in other words, and lots that are smaller than 3,500 or uh, 35 feet in width, oops, sorry about that. What happened? Yeah, the, the lots that are um, 3,500 square feet, 35 feet in width, um, where 5,000 and, and uh, 50 foot minimums um, are, are uh, required, um, they, can, they can apply for a CFCA only, but they would also uh, require a use permit. Now, the mandatory lot merger program um, would would as I said, it would start out voluntary. Um, zoning, the zoning and subdivision ordinances both establish uh, processes for merger of contiguous parcels, um, and the board adopted a policy in two thousand and six authorizing mandatory lot merger program, and this program was never implemented. Um, we're proposing that it be one of the first um, efforts undertaken after approval of Connect the Coastside. Um, so at least two contiguous parties, parcels in the same ownership, um, at least one parcel would have to be undeveloped. These are the conditions for merger. Um, the area of at least one parcel would be less than 4,500 square feet in R1 or R3, um, and less than 5,000 square feet in RMCZ and the voucher uh, would be offered as an incentive to get people to come in and voluntarily merge initially, and they would get a small density bonus or a small square footage bonus for construction um, and, um, and, and if, they, if they were to pursue a voluntary merger. Um, after there, there's, there would be a process for hearing and appeals for the mandatory merger that would take effect after 18 months of allowing folks to come in voluntarily. Um, the lot merger program would um, support the LCV policy for lot consolidation. Um, it, lot merger is assumed in the build out calculations uh, and is consistent with the methodology used for the Midcoast LCP amendment of 2012. Um, we estimate that there are 216 lots eligible in the unincorporated Midcoast and that uh, vacant substandard lots would decrease by uh, 40%. So you'd end up with larger lots with more private open space um, and, um, and less development potential um, on, on the Midcoast. Now the um, mandatory lot retirement program, this is different from lot merger. Um, mandatory lot retirement involves um, a one-to-one -one retirement of development rights on existing lots in exchange for new lots. So if um, someone wants to subdivide and create new lots, they would need to retire as many lots um, as they would create um, in order to subdivide the property that they wish to subdivide. Um, the Coastal Commission has required this as a condition of approval on some recent projects in Half Moon Bay and in other places, um, and it was a recommended program for the Midcoast LCP amendment. Um, the uh, proposed policy concept currently in the Connect the Coast side um, identifies donor sites located outside of the existing developed areas, um, but also outside areas containing sensitive habitat or designated for conservation, open space, or recreation or agriculture. 
Um, it would apply only when new residential subdivision is proposed um, and um, would not apply to infill development. So the lot retirement program would follow the Coastal Commission's recommendation. And we believe there are approximately 148 eligible donor lots in the unincorporated Midcoast, assuming that the lot merger program is also in effect. So it wouldn't be targeting the same uh, lots. Um, so this map shows the um, areas. If, if you look at the red outlined lots, those are lots that are eligible for the uh, lot merger program. So um, looking up in um, Eastern Montana, there's a number of RMCZ lots that are less than 5,000 square feet that could be merged to contiguous parcels to create compliant parcels. Within the um, more sort of suburban scale neighborhoods um, along the along Highway 1, you can see there's a, a scattering of, of substandard lots that could be merged with the adjoining parcels. Um, with regard to the um, urban mid-coast, the lots eligible for potential re lot retirement are shown in black outline. And I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but there's some in, um, in Montera, there's one in Moss Beach, there's, um, you know, there's not that many um, in the urbanized midcoast that are, um, that meet the, the you know, sort of size criteria for, or, or potential donor, donor sites or sites for lot retirement. But when we look at the, um, oh, and I, I wanna back up just a second, because there was one more thing on there. The um, paper subdivisions you can see here in El Granada. I guess that's, I said they were in Moss Beach, but I was wrong. They're only in El Granada. But um, these are ones that would be subject to the constrained um, um, certificate of compliance process. Um, and then looking at the broader um, mid coast, there are lots. Um, outside the urbanized midcoast and the rural midcoast that could also be targets for um, lot retirement. And um, these would result in reduced traffic uh, because if, you know, if, if these, because these lots potentially could be developed um, and, and um, would also uh, result in protecting uh, open space and um, probably habitat values. Um, so the, the last uh, land use policy that we have in the um, Connect the Coast side is the traffic fee mitigation program. And, and the idea here is that as the coast side develops, um, new projects would pay uh, some amount for the traffic impacts of their project. And those funds would be used to um, fund the, um, projects that are in Connect the Coast side. So traffic impact fee could be established to fund these improvements. It would apply to uh, new housing and commercial at a rate based on the proportion of need attributable to the new development. So in other words, basically attributable to the traffic generated by the new development, which is based on size. Um, it's not a growth management strategy, but it could have a, a effective lowering development because it raises the cost of development. Um, so how would we go about um, doing this? First, we estimate the amount of new development expected um, from the constrained development forecast, determine what proposed projects and or percentage of projects uh, could be attributed uh, to the to new development. Um, and then look at the um, estimated traffic generation of those projects, um, boil that down into a dwelling per dwelling unit or a per square foot rate, and then use that to apportion the costs of um, the traffic improvements. And this is basically the description of a required nexus study that we would have to do in order to implement this program. Um, any 
any fee-based program like this has to go through a nexus study to demonstrate that the sort of the fairness of the of the fee so that it is tied directly to the impacts and also that the um that the um people paying it would benefit from the um in public improvements that would be built with the money. Um, so this table shows um, the um, fees, potential fees. These were uh, developed um, back in 2016 and um, are based on what the cost of improvements were at that time. It's possible that the cost of improvements has gone up slightly and that um, Therefore, the yield from this transit or traffic uh, fee mitigation program would be slightly higher. But currently, it was projected to yield almost 16 million um, based on the uh, growth in uh, dwelling unit equivalents and the um, cost per dwelling unit equivalent. Now, a dwelling unit equivalent doesn't mean it doesn't mean that we're going to get 2,600 new houses on the coastside. It just means that. Um, you base the, um, you, you develop a, a common measure that's called a dwelling unit equivalent and um, and then a, a assign the um, cost to each project based on how many dwelling unit equivalents it has. So a single family has one, a multifamily has half, a retail project has 1.35, an office 1.17 and an industrial 1.09. So each would pay a proportionally different uh, fee based on the traffic generation. Um, so that concludes the presentation on those uh, three topics. Um, our next steps are to present what we heard to you at August 10th uh, to revise the plan um, and, and then um, have Mid Coast Community Council and Planning Commission workshops on the plan as it's re been revised, make more revisions to the plan, and then begin the formal uh, presentation process to decision makers, uh, preceded by a, a final presentation before the MCC. Um, and of course, all this information is available um, on uh, the Connect the Coastside website. And I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, first I'm going to ask from the council to ask the people if they have any clarifying questions. Before we do that, uh, Joe, can you go ahead and make me the host again? Yes. Me being MCC Zoom. <laughs> um, I, oof, let's see. That's not it. Um, you go into the participants list. Yeah. And then find MCC Zoom. It has the MCC logo picture. Okay. And then there you should have an option to change host. Where do you? Yeah, I. I That did it. Hey, not bad okay. for a lot of <clears throat> Okay. So you're good, Dave? Yeah. You're kind of, okay. I'm going to go through uh, the council to ask for clarifying questions to Joe. I'm going to start with Claire. Okay, I have comments, but you only want questions at this point, right? Correct. Okay. Uh, cur currently, there is a ceiling on the number of new residential units developed per year. Would that ceiling continue, or how is, would that be modified? Um, at present, the the model that we develop for um, development projections through twenty forty is based on keeping the forty unit um, ceiling in place. So far, uh, we've been tracking um, building permits. We also have a 466 unit cap on the number of second units that can be built on the coast side that's in the LCP. So um, 
So despite the you know changes in state law regarding um, flexing up the rules on second units, there's still a cap for that. But um, the 40 uh, you know residential building permits per year cap we we propose would just stay in place. And um, to date, we've not ever done more than 20 in a year since we've been tracking since 2015. And um, so there, there hasn't yet been a year where we've exceeded 20. Joe, did you say 466 second units? That's correct. Okay. And we're thank tracking you. those as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, anything else? Um, Dan? <clears throat> You're muted, Dan. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Joe. Um, so I got a question. You, you, wow, you really covered a lot tonight, Joe. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff there. Um, uh, all important and uh, probably is really going to dramatically affect our community. So um, you mentioned the roundabouts in 92, and you talked about um, making it safer for pedestrians to cross at these intersections. Um, so I've never seen any pedestrians crossing um, at, I think the two intersections you were talking about is uh, at the Crystal Springs, the lower, uh, the light at 92 near 280, and then also up at the summit at 35. Right, those are the only two roundabouts you're talking about, correct? Correct. And and I think part of the reason that you don't see pedestrians at the upper um, intersection on the west end is um, because the trails aren't there, and they will be soon. Um, and and when they are, um, then I think you will see you know quite a, quite a few pedestrians up there. I think at the lower the interest is greater for bicyclists than for pedestrians in that area. Um, and the idea is, of course, we would make it safe for both um, and probably greater number of cyclists would use the lower uh, one than the upper. But obviously, if you build it, sometimes they will come. Yeah, and... Uh, um... All throughout this Connect the Coast Side process, there's never been any serious consideration towards pedestrian underpasses. Um, just wanted to confirm there there were no uh, ever any feasibility studies. There's, there's really no data to confirm how expensive they are. Is that correct? Yes, we don't. We've never um, uh, evaluated the cost of developing and undercrossing. Um, in part because um, my, my experience in, I, I've done open space and trail planning for over 30 years. And um, I, um, I found that people don't like under crossings. They're because they're dark mm -hmm. and they're enclosed and um, often they're uh, damp and um, difficult to maintain, but um and 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 not heavily used, right? Um, every uh, concern you have is is uh, able to be uh, uh, corrected. Um, you can have; they don't have to be dark. They don't have to be damp. Um, it's uh, really. Uh, would you agree that it's really the only crossing that would actually improve traffic, because the uh, traffic would not have to stop. Yeah. For pedestrian. Dan, Dan, we're looking for clarification questions and we will come back for further questions. Well, I'm, so, I'm, I'm just getting, trying to get clarification as to why pedestrian underpasses are not on the table. They're not uh, seriously considered to, when they're, the, when they're the only uh, crossing that actually does improve safety and uh, traffic flow. Okay. okay, thanks, Dan. I'm going to go to Dave. Um, yeah, uh, very brief question. 
uh, Joe, the, the lots that you showed in the, in the rural mid coast in black, uh, I believe that almost all of those are either now in GGNRA or post. Um, is that a current map or was that from 2016 also? That's from 2016 and we will look into that and get back to you. Okay, that, that's the only question I have, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Barb? Barbara? Uh, you're on mute, Barb. Barb, please unmute. Can you help there, Dave? Go ahead, Barbara. I don't have anything. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have two, two questions um, for clarification. With the delay index, the way you position that, is that intended as a, as a critical measure to address what was asked for in the CTFP and chartering paragraph, to have a method to sort of assess impact? So you would look at delay index at a particular segment and try to determine um, whether new activity would, would basically increase the delay? Yes, and, and we, we, are treating, we are treating Highway 1 from, um, from Montero, from, from first to, um, to Murata Road as one segment. It's, it's important to note that um, the, the delay in the, the delay in Half Moon Bay is pretty tremendous. And so once you get close to or south of Frenchman's Creek, that's where the, um, the delay in depth that was analyzed for um, the entire segment of Highway 1 from, from First Street to Highway 92 where the, the delay index is non is sort of non-conforming, um, but we don't really have control over Half Moon Bay. Um, so as a result, we um, are not reporting those numbers. But so just within the segment you talked about, which was First Street, Montero to Murata Road. Yeah. So if, if a project is looked at, how would you, make an estimate of how it's going to affect the delay index. What what would be the tools used to determine that? The traffic model. And, uh, the VTA, the VTA CCAG traffic model. And uh, so what you would feed in the, the additional uh, traffic created by a project? Correct. That model would compute that? Yes, it would. Is that something that, that uh, you know, an information meeting you could sort of more tangibly how that would work, that it is working now and could show what it produces. I guess that, that seems a critical element of what you're trying to do. And, and although I understand the concept of a model, it would be helpful to get some sense of you know, how that works. And yeah, absolutely. Really we can do that at a later meeting. Okay. And uh, what was the name of the model? It's the CCAG VTA traffic model because our county's transportation planning infrastructure isn't as robust as other counties. We contract with um, the Santa Clara County, uh, you know, VTA to mm -hmm. um, um, Valley Transportation Authority to, they, they prepare Santa Clara County's model. They also prepare ours. And, um, and so that's why it has that name, the CCAG VTA traffic mm -hmm. model. And, and similarly, for the, the traffic fee mitigation, uh, how I, I assume that, that when a new project comes in, it's not designed to mitigate the whole cost of a particular road improvement, but just some fraction of it. What, how is that determined? Let's well, see. as I said, um, we have what is a rudimentary nexus study that was done um, in 2016 to establish a kind of a hypothetical cost per project and yield for 
uh, development over a 25 year period. And the um, and those are the numbers that I showed you in the uh, table. But in order to implement a transportation um, impact fee program like that, we're required by law to do a um, nexus study that looks at the nexus between the traffic impacts of a project and the cost that we would ascribe to that project for those impacts and also look at the benefits that project would derive from the expenditure of the fees on um, transportation improvements to demonstrate that the fee is fair and it is com it is uh, consistent with the requirements of state law. Okay, thank you for now. Okay, um, I'm gonna go back through the council and take uh, just open questions you might have for Joe. And uh, this time we'll start at the other end. Barb, do you have anything of an open question? No. Is that no? Yeah. Uh, Dave? Uh, no open questions at this point. Dan? Yes, um, I'd like to hear more about, you know, the delay index and what will be uh, once whatever the delay index is determined, uh, how will that influence um, whatever's going to be uh, changed with uh, 92 or Highway 1? I'm, um, I'm not sure I understand your question, Dan. Um, how, how is the delay index going to, um, what, well, maybe, maybe let me take a crack at it and see if, if, I'm, if I'm on the right track. Um, so one of, one of the things that um, needs to happen is that improvements in Connect the Coast Side need to be done um, in a manner that maintains the delay index, um, the performance of the highways one and 92. So there needs to be a linkage between the transportation improvements and development that occurs so that you don't end up in a situation where you have a non-compliant roadway. Is that, is that what you were getting? Well, it, that just seems to uh, really open up uh, a lot of complications because uh, traffic historically, um, you know, is more delayed when more people want to come here, whether it's a, a holiday weekend or, you know, if there's a, a, just a sunny weekend, whatever. Um, it's it's a bit unpredictable, but obviously the the more people that want to come here and do come here and get on the highway, the, the more uh, traffic will be delayed. So I'm I'm not quite clear on how you're uh, speaking of this uh, taking this delay index and calculating it um, <clears throat> is. Um, you know, really going to be used. I, I just don't, uh, it's first I've heard of it. Um, well, it's, it's going to be used to evaluate projects and it's going to be used to evaluate the uh, overall performance of the Highway 1 and Highway 92 systems so that it, it won't be just a, um, a measure that's you know used for projects, but it'll also be used to measure the success of implementation of Connect the Coast Side. So Len and Joe, perhaps I can clarify something. I, I think I'm hearing a slightly different question. So Dan, there's the there's the peak delay index, and then there's the free flowing delay index, and it's the comparison between the two. And currently they've got measurements for a peak period. Um, peak periods and peak delays will change over time, but you do a measurement over a period of time and that's your peak for, for that to the next time you measure it. 
Well, if you put a bunch of uh, crossings with beacon lights so pedestrians crossing the road stop traffic, you're just going to uh, explode the delay. So, um, and you've talked about a lot of beacon uh, on demand uh, uh, crossing uh, lights. So, I, I see the train coming headed straight towards me. Um, you know, these implementations are going to make the free flowing. Uh, traffic much worse it's very clear okay i don't think there's further answer to that one now dan okay um next is claire claire you're muted uh there joe, you go. thank you joe I have, I have two quick things one regarding the climbing lanes between the quarry and the present climbing lanes yes uh, you may want to check on the future operation plans of the quarry um because um you know i can't say anything about it but you you may find that there's different needs as time goes on um and the other point is just out of, just out of curiosity i noticed that the um, southbound Highway 1 uh, was noted to be worse on the afternoons, and I just don't think that sounds accurate. Um, it sounds it seems much worse in the mornings to me. Um, either either I'm wrong or maybe an updated study might be useful to just see if changes have, have uh, occurred since the study was done. Thank you. We have um, been checking. So we did the, you know, 20... 14 counts that are the basis for um, the analysis and connect the coast side. We've subsequently done counts in 2017 and 2019 um, in, in um, Moss Beach for the roundabout analyses. And we looked at the 2017 numbers today and they're not significant. They're not significantly different from uh, 2014, but we are, we, we need to take a look at the 20, 2019 numbers and see um, where where those are, but um, that those and and those counts were taken on um, June and September days. Um, so they were school year was in session, and an, another was very you know lovely um, holiday weekend. So. Um, we 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 feel like we bracketed the you know conditions fairly well, but we will take another look at at those uh, numbers based on your comment. Yeah, the the weekend delay on that stretch is very bad, but the weekday does not seem bad to me. Okay, I'd like to uh, add something to uh, Claire's uh, concern. Uh, commuting, coming home today at four p.m. northbound on Highway One, approaching uh frenchman's creek <clears throat> traffic was very bad it was definitely delayed um getting closer to uh frenchman's creek i, I see that the highway uh is uh light as red pedestrians are crossing lots of pedestrians are crossing uh, as soon as the light turns green another pedestrian comes out of uh, frenchman creeks and, and hits the uh the crossing button one more time. I mean, five seconds after it turned uh, turned green. So what's happening is uh, at Frenchman's Creek, they have a, a wonderful access to the California Coastal Trail and people are using it a lot. Not only uh, people in the community of Frenchman's Creek, but uh, also, um, you know, the, 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 the people that are using the uh, multimodal uh, parallel trail that are using that intersection as a crossing. So uh, that crossing, uh, pedestrians and cyclists, you know, are really impacting the flow of uh, traffic on Highway One. Uh, and uh, of course, in the afternoon when it's sunny, uh, people want to go for a walk, get out on their bike. Um, and so I think that's what you might be hearing about, Claire. Uh, I'm witnessing it um, on a daily basis. Thank you, Dan. Okay. Anything? Did you suddenly want to say something, Joe? Uh, no, I, well, I just wanted to mention that we are still coordinating with Half Moon Bay. Um, unfortunately, that light is 
um, in Half Moon Bay and Caltrans control, not ours, but um, we, we do believe there are some, you know, a series of improvements could be made over the years at Frenchman's. Um, and, um, you know, if funding were available, we think a roundabout would be a great solution there. But in the interim, um, just working on the um, on-demand signal and, and the signal timing um, could be a real benefit there. Okay. I think a pedestrian underpass would really, really uh, solve the problem. Okay. Okay, uh, at this point, I'd like to ask members of the public if they have uh, questions for Joe. If you do, if you would raise your hand. Okay. We had Greg, JQ, and then Harold in that order. Okay, thanks, I see it. Okay, we'll go first with Greg Diegas. I have uh, about five questions, and that may be too much for this time. So let me start by asking Joe, where, how, when uh, should I submit these questions to who, to you in writing and expect to get answers? That would be fine, yeah. If you wanna submit questions to us, we'd be happy to uh, provide you with responses. So, okay. All right, so if I could just Quick touch on two things then. Let me just interrupt and we'll talk about further meetings we'll have and we will collect questions there and convey them to the county as well. Go ahead. All right, well, so let me just hit the top two questions. Uh, Joe, it's good to see these land use matters being explained in more detail. There's a lot more explanation here than was in the January 15 draft or on the uh, fact sheet, I think you called it the land use one pager on the website. <clears throat> you had a lot uh, of detail that I'd like to understand and look at. And the question is, where is that in writing? Um, there is on our website a... 2016 report um, on land use policies, and uh, it was prepared by our consultants, Diet Bhatia, and they're the ones who did the thoroughgoing analysis of identifying the potential lots to merge, the potential lots to retire, um, and worked with us on um, developing those uh, programs, including the um, transportation mitigation fee? I did not find it. So I'm wondering, uh, I don't expect you to know off the top of your head, but could somebody- I can send it to you if you uh, send me your email address. Okay, great. Actually, um, I probably, and I then, probably have your email address because- Yeah, you, I bet, I'll bet you do, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I could ask one other question. Um, table 15 um, back in, uh, I think the January 15th report showed the level of service was failing at build out on seven of the 11 intersections listed. And, and then you had a delay index chart back in your 2016 draft deck for connect the coast side showing a huge red stretch on the coast where the delay index was failing. So I'm wondering two things is the delay data that you're showing today based on 2014 or is it based on the 2017 numbers you just were talking about? It's based on 2014. And as I said, the 2017 numbers correct right. the 2014 numbers. Okay. Well, so then the question is, why don't we do this post COVID since things seem to have changed? Well, we, we can't predict um, what the uh, long-term impacts of COVID are. And for now, my, my instructions are to complete this plan based on the analysis we've done so far. And uh, so I'm gonna keep working in that direction until I hear otherwise. Okay, so uh, who's giving you those orders? Um, the super Board of Supervisors and um, the Planning Director. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next is JQ. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay, uh, I have several questions. Um, again, I was wondering about the measurement means for transportation. Um, you're using the delay index, and how does that compare to level of service, and especially VMT? Why was vehicle miles traveled actually ruled out as a valid measure? Uh, that's just one question. And then um, I also assume that the 
this is based on a, a time measure of corridors. And so there has to be some baseline. I think you mentioned, mentioned it was 2014 data. But how do you extrapolate those values out to 2040? When you look at the numbers in those tables, oops, that interference. Uh, when you look at the numbers in those tables, um, they, you know, it's it's like they're they're not they're they're not much different, and in fact they're worse. If you look at the ones with the transportation projects, the delay indexes in are actually worse or about the same than the ones without it. So how do you explain that? And then also, um, again, like I said, we should compare the level of service VMT data with the with the uh, deficiency index. And then why did you choose a, a cutoff level of twofold? Is that rather arbitrary? It seems rather arbitrary. Um, and then finally, regarding mitigation fees, I was wondering how those are calculated. What are the assumptions that go in? And actually, if you could show how the, the math is all done there, and the same with the dwelling unit equivalents, how are those actually calculated? Uh, you mentioned some reports, so hopefully all that detail is in there, but that's it, thank you. Yeah, I think that's a little bit more than I can cover this evening in terms of responses to your questions. Um, so with regard to um, why we're using um, delay, we're using delay because level of service um, would require widening Highway 1 in order to meet um, the level of service standards. So I mentioned that in my presentation. Um, the uh, VMT is going to apply to uh, projects on the mid coast, regardless of what's in Connect the Coast side, because state law requires and, and provides that the only significance criteria that can be used in a CEQA context going forward in the state of California is to use VMT. Um, you cannot use delay index, you cannot use LOS to identify significant impacts for CEQA. We, we're in the process at the county of developing the significance criteria that we will use um, for assessing or identifying significant impacts pursuant to uh, VMT. And um, the, um, although those were supposed to be in place by July 1st, um, we're a bit late and we're planning to take a proposal to the Board of Supervisors um, early in August. Um, the, um, see your other question had to do with uh, um, the tables showing greater impact under um, post um, build out than um, under um, no, the no project condition. Um, we'll take a look at those numbers and see whether or not there are mistakes in there. We believe that those are accurate. Um, and what was your other question? Um, I was also asking, well, you already, you already said how, how do those compare, but I was wondering about the, the mitigation fees. Um, yeah. And how those um, are calculated, the assumptions and all the math that goes into that. And you, you mentioned a report, so um, I, yeah, I can get that from Greg if you're sending that same report to him. Yeah, it's available in the report. But then uh, one other thing uh, with regard to the corridors, you're, you're really only showing two or one corridor in that table on the coast side, the first street to Murata Road, and back and forth. Um, and going forward, can you actually parse that, actually look at smaller segments in that area to see if perhaps there are pinch points that, that present themselves as, as areas where you should really focus? Well, that's what Connect the Coast Side does. It identifies the pinch points and that's where intersection control is recommended at California Cypress, currently at 16th, although we're not sure that's gonna persist. Um, and um, as I mentioned, I think some improvements to intersection control at uh, Frenchman's in conjunction with um, the signal timing that's already been coordinated um, as a result of Connect the Coast Side between Main 92, Main uh, uh, 92 and 1, and Main um, Highway 1, those three uh, signals, based on uh, the advice and, and um, input from our consultant, who was also the consultant to um, Half Moon Bay, those, the signal timing of those uh, lights was changed to improve their synchronization and, and, and an improved performance of, of those lights. So all those interventions 
are intended to address the pinch points that you mentioned. But but if you're so you're saying it will be parsed. So if you're just looking at first, no, reading, we're not going to parse. We're actually going to look at sections there. Or? No, we're not. Then I don't understand how you're going to or find the pinch points and where to put the where to focus on the improvement. Use the transportation model. It, there were measurements at quite a few intersections, and there it, there's like a 25 page appendix uh, in in the document that has all of those individual measurements in it. And those were done in 2014, though, correct? Yeah, they're outdated. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you, JQ. Uh, next up is Harold. Yeah, uh, hello, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So I, I'm i a bit speechless, I must say. So I'm uh, regarding the delay index and the new way to calculate it. And the reason why I say that is, so as Greg mentioned, so when we look at the 2016 Connect the Coast site based on 2014 data, and on page 39, we see a delay index chart. And basically that shows pretty much all red from the tunnel all the way to Half Moon Bay. So that's one data point. Now, if you fast forward to 2020, and again, we are using outdated 2014 data. Um, on page 41, we see a level of service. So that's a different way to calculate. So page 41, January 2020 CTC publication. In that chart, we see plenty of Fs, Ds, Es all over intersections, basically all deficiencies. Uh, the interesting one is there's a line also for Highway 1 Carlos intersection, and it shows existing a B and then for build out a C. So we all know there's Cypress Point, there's an estimated 500 daily trips. So how can that be C, question mark? So I don't think that's a valid data point. Um, that gets interesting now is basically what you showed tonight. And I want to mention, again, if you go to the January 2020 January document that's published, on page 49, you have, um, so you introduce the travel time. And here for half moon bay to city, the city limit to I-280, you are talking about northbound, southbound, you say free flow travel time is eight minutes, 42 minutes. And then you show delay indexes of 18, 36, 59, 22, 118, 135. So this is January 2020. If I look at your deck now, you also talk about travel time, and that's the one 2040 build out conditions, peak hour roadway segment, delayed index, does not include recommended transportation projects. Somehow you're showing here now 1.427, 1.425, 1.427, 1.426. So all below 2.0. So how does that reconcile? So I'm really confused by that. And well, um, I'm, yeah. a, I'm, a, I'm a data guy. Yeah. Finish, please. Harold? You've uh, taken up a fair bit of your time, and we want Joe to have a chance to respond. So could that's all right. He can keep going as long as he wants. And you know the other one is so in the 2020 material, you're not really specifying you the underlying planning assumption. So on page 43, so you have footnotes in there where you basically talk about the constraint, non-residential, and then commercial developments. And in the footnote, you basically say development project under review as identified by San Mateo County in 2013 to 2015. So why doesn't that include 2020? Because we have Dunes Beach, we have Navi Park, we have a Hyatt Hotel, we have Big Wave, of course, we have Cypress Point. So all this doesn't seem to be included here based on the footnote I'm seeing. So I'm very confused and, you know, let me finish. So what we saw before is we have a level of service, we have a delay index, all red in 2016. We have level of service numbers that you show in your own report in 2020. And now you come up with a different way to calculate the delay index to stay under the critical mark. And I think that's what we heard tonight. 
So I'm well concerned about this because that's really not what we are seeing here as residents. You're going to get hammered with more and more traffic. And yeah, right now it's a bit more quiet because of the le le less commute times, but the, the visitors are coming and I don't think what you're presenting here is realistic. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Did you want to make any comment there or take it? Well, I will, I will say that um, we have been recalculating the um, delay index numbers in the January 20 report because we found some errors um, in, in the work that was done um, supporting those. And, and um, after we've completed all of our work, um, we will um, present that. But the, um, you have to understand that Connect the Coast side is a plan level document. It, it, um, and it's unfortunate that it went on hiatus for a couple of years, but um, those, uh, that's water under the bridge at this point. The, um, the, when you do a plan level document, you um, look at um, as best you can a snapshot of existing conditions and uh, things that you know are in the pipeline and you make projections for development um, based on the zoning in the mid coast and, and you assign traffic potential based on that, the development of you know, that zoning and um, of those parcels and then you assign that um, traffic to the highways and the intersections and evaluate the level of service now or delay index or VMT depending on what standard you're using. Um, the plan is used to identify transportation improvements that are needed to improve traffic conditions overall on the coast side and to address the impacts of build out. Now, um, when individual projects come along, they're required to do their own independent analysis within the context of this larger plan. And it may be that the um, individual project will have greater impact than um, was contemplated in the plan. That doesn't mean that the project um, has gets a pass on um, transportation impacts uh, because of Connect the Coast Side. Um, Connect the Coast Side is a capital improvement plan um, that's, that's intended to um, be related to the projected development on the coast side. And um, it's, it's never going to be 100% accurate. The goal is to identify that suite of projects and the funding that's gonna be needed in order to improve those projects, to work with the community, to prioritize those projects and build those that are um, needed first, first and um, or needed most first and, um, and, and build accordingly uh, based on community priorities and needs. Um, it's, it's um, so, Cypress Point will do the, it has their own you know traffic analysis that will be part of a permit for that project and environmental analysis that goes along with it, just as Big Wave had, and just as other um, projects that are large enough to trigger um, the requirement to prepare an environmental document and assess the traffic impacts of that project, um, and to the extent that the improvements that are needed for that project exceed what's um, contemplated in the Connect the Coast side, then they'll be responsible for that. Okay, okay. next is Marcia Yates. Hello, Marcia Yates, Moss Beach. I just wanna make a comment on that last thing that Joe just said about the developments will be responsible for paying for capital improvements over and above or what uh, of the current projects. Um, I find that the, the planning commission lets these big projects off. Once they say, okay, you have to do this and you have to do that, 
And then they go back and go, well, we don't want to do that. And then the planning commission says, oh, it's okay. I mean, we saw that with Big Wave. We hammered out this agreement with Big Wave. It went, everybody signed off on it. And then when it didn't fit what the developer wanted, the planning commission changed changed a lot of the um, the way that Big Wave was supposed to be um, built. So I don't have much credence, uh, confidence that um, the capital improvements will be socialized and that the development, will, all the profits will be privatized. But also, I feel like um, Connect the Coast side hasn't really matured much from when it started for uh, five or six years ago. I, I still think you guys are not listening to us. You're saying, oh yes, we'll have better um, public transportation. But I went to a couple of Caltrans things and they say for every dollar they invest here on the coast for transportation, they only make, um, they, they get a 15 cent return on investment and they're not gonna improve it anytime soon. And Horsley was in a couple of those meetings so he knows how they feel. But I also just want to say that I think JQ has a lot of great points. Harold is really great on transportation. And um, I think Connect the Coast Side really needs to listen to these guys because you are not listening to us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> next is Dolores Silva. Hello, Dolores. Uh, yes, sorry, I was having a little, finding it a little tricky to unmute. Um, well, I think Joe sort of answered a couple, a couple of points that I was wondering about. I was wondering if this traffic mitigation fee of $15 million that's used now um, in, this, uh, in this presentation, and how it was determined, you know, how that would be allocated to new development. Um, does that mean that when I look at that amount, I mean, it's kind of low compared to like, if I, I mean, I, we certainly all think that if there is a roundabout needed for, um, or there's some kind of solution that's needed for Cypress Point, I assume that is, not is outside this 15 million. For example, if it were a roundabout, they seem to be in a neighborhood of seven to $10 million. So I think you said that would be the case in what, um, in your response uh, earlier, is that true? And then secondly, one of the things that's very important to the community is how these, options that are proposed like these, uh, whether they're, whatever traffic control you use in the, uh, here on Moss Beach and in Montera and further down, I mean, how, what's the impact on emergencies? Right now, I think if there is an emergency, uh, some kind of traffic accident or even, or maybe it's just a health emergency, um, it is very difficult for an emergency vehicle to move through here. What is being considered for that or is anything? And you know, the other big thing is evacuation, but uh, that's somehow not a concern of Connect the Coast Site, which is uh, not making anybody feel better about it. So these are some major areas that I'm just not understanding in this plan. And I agree that um, these questions that uh, JQ and Harold are at, are asking are very much on our minds. So hopefully we can dig in a little bit further. And lastly, I really feel that part of our confusion is that, uh, you know, it's taken four years. There's been a four year hiatus and the people that were really driving this in the previous years from when it started, what was it in 2012? Um, what was it 14? Um, these people, the key uh, drivers of, of that are now kind of in other jobs or retired or just not participating. And for example, Lisa is, but she's not really involved in these discussions. And they have so much history that that's what we gain so much from these uh, 
big meetings that we used to have where people were there and you could hear what everybody had to say. And uh, we could build on those, those, uh, that experience of these other people who, and what they have gone through. Like, I don't, I understand very little about lot merger programs, but I'm trying to. And it was a lot clearer than when we had people like, um, well, I won't go into the details, but anyway, um, these uh, virtual meetings really leave us with a lot of unsatisfactory feeling that somehow what was on the table when this stopped in 2016 has somehow been lost. I don't know if, um, if, if uh, getting back to my original question about my assumption now that maybe if there is a roundabout needed for Cypress Point, that Midpen will be on the hook for that. And that uh, perhaps you have something to say, to say about emergency evacuation concerns. Um, thank you, Dolores. Um, so with regard to um, the impact fee, and as I mentioned, it won't be um, in place until the Nexus study is done. Um, with regard to improvements in Moss Beach, we believe that a, a follow-on um, study of the Moss Beach corridor is appropriate and is something that we will um, rec will insert into the plan as, as we make um, changes to it because we think that a, a community-based process for determining um, the uh, location of pedestrian crossings and the type of intersection control that um, is done there would, would benefit from um, you know, a robust public engagement. Um, as far as um, whether or not um, MidPen will be required to um, pay for a, a portion of a roundabout, um, they would, whatever um, improvement is needed at California, um, they will pay their fair share of, of that improvement. That, intersection currently meets a signal warrant um, under the level of service standards that Caltrans administers for Highway 1. And so um, it's not, you know, their, their um, impact is proportional to the existing uh, traffic from the existing uh, neighborhoods. So, um, um, And, and as far as evacuations go, uh, we believe that um, any interventions on the highway will be designed in such a way that they won't compromise, um, you know, current evacuation potential um, and or, or future evacuation potential. And there's um, a good deal of, of work that's underway um, on evacuation that's being led by CAL FIRE um, our fire chief, Jonathan Cox, has created this zonal um, system that is um, useful not only for um, fire evacuations, and that's why they developed it, um, but it's also useful for other um, kinds of crises that might emerge that the um, emergency managers can use to alert people to evacuate in, in zones rather than all at once so that um, constrained highways like 92 and 1 um, can be evacuated safely. And those who are you know most needing to evacuate first are alerted, told to evacuate, and others are encouraged to wait um, until, you know, until their time. Obviously, you can't control that 100%, but um, so there's, there's a good deal of work that's underway to address uh, evacuation uh, planning in, in other circles besides Connect the Coast side. So uh, a question about uh, the mitigation fee in a, in a framework sense. So if a, a, an intersection is going to receive a control without regard to whether it's a signal light or a roundabout, and the cost of that is $2 million, and you get grant support from some agency for one half of that. For the remainder, does 
a, a new project have a certain percent of that that they would pay or is there, I mean, I'm trying to understand from a, from an overall perspective, what, what share of the dollars they, a, a new project would pay? Well, I think it, right now it's a case by case negotiation because there's no program in place. So under your scenario, um, a project would be, you know, whatever the Delta is between the grant and the cost would be borne in some proportion by the, um, by the project and by other sources of funding. Um, I mean, that's still going to be true to some extent under the, but under the mitigation fee, in lieu of negotiating those numbers each time you have a project, you would have this, um, whether people think the dwelling unit equivalent is the right metric for um, identifying what the, uh, what the fee should be, um, each project would pay um, proportionally their transportation impact fee, and that money would go into a pool that would be used to implement projects and connect the coast side. Um, of course, you know, those, uh, um, we think that the community should be involved in setting those priorities so that the most important projects are the ones that are built first. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, Dan, you have your hand up. Yes, Joe. Um, you mentioned earlier that there were you've uh, discovered errors in the in the data, um, traffic data, and uh, not in the question. data in the calculations. Yeah, the calculations. Um, so my question is, uh, when you find errors like that, is it documented and then available for public review, or is it just changed with no record? Um, well. When we revise Connect the Coast side, um, we will explain, you know, why we made the changes that we made. So, I mean, I see a, I see a series of revisions over the next several months. We're going to revise based on all the feedback that we've received through the virtual meetings, meetings tonight, other other uh, feedback that we'll get between now and um, when we sort of go dark and 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 start revising at at the end of the month um, and then um, we will um, as far as like identifying um, errors in calculations we're happy to um, to daylight those if if that's the desire of the of the MCC to know you know what mistakes were made um, in the in the 2020 draft and and some of those are carryovers from from earlier drafts but um we're happy to happy to share that information yeah i think it would help the public to understand the process and to you know uh just be aware of what's you know what's going on i agree thank you dan um marcia you have your hand up again yeah, I have a question. When um, Joe, you were talking about um, projects and and what proportion of the traffic um, road construction that they would uh, participate in, or the percentage, um, whose traffic studies do they base that on? The projects um, traffic studies. Caltrans traffic studies or the Connect the Coast Side traffic studies? As I mentioned, Marcia, the Connect the Coast Side um, analysis is at a plan level, so it's inappropriate to use it for evaluating projects. Projects, uh, generally speaking, hire their own consultants to um, analyze. So we base. So we base. Let finish. Let him finish, please. Let him finish. Go ahead. Um, they, they, do the analysis and then our department of public works um, who has seasoned capable traffic engineers in it review that work to see whether it's credible or not and if they don't think it is then they um, tell them that and they make them go back and make changes um, so the um, the uh, any traffic study that's prepared by a project in 
to describe its traffic impacts um, is um, peer reviewed by our public works department. Um, and to the extent they need to, um, they can um, hire consultants to peer review it themselves um, and, and provide feedback to the, uh, to the project sponsor and their consultant to make revisions based on that. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, that uh, is the uh, end of our uh, section A, Matilda's presentation. I wanna thank you for taking the time and answering the questions. Uh, there'll be some follow-up I'll try to get you in terms of points raised. Uh, thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to present and answer questions tonight. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a, a quick reprise on the public comment on virtual meetings. Uh, this is just to ask for members of the public who would like to make fairly just short observations to share about the virtual meetings. Um, so for this one, we're going to go to the public first. If there's anyone here and they, that basically you're interested in the, your information takeaway, key things you would still like to know and what worked well and what did not work well in the meetings. So if there's any member of the public who would like to speak, and I know this dealt with this a lot in comments made in response to Joe, uh, but I see Greg has his hand up. Go ahead, Greg. Well, I thought we covered this already, but maybe I'm misremembering it. Um, why don't I just put it in writing? I thought we already discussed all the drawbacks we saw with those meetings. We have at different points. I mean, it, uh, Joe, Joe's preparing his group will prepare a summary, and it's a, it's a plan. If you have just a particular point, it's fine. We have it has. Been I don't have just one point. There were a number of them. How about I just write an email to you or to the to the community council, and then you can consider that as a submission. Yeah, we okay. submit that, and at the same time, just copy Joe as well. Okay. Okay. And I see we don't have any others. Uh, uh, there, uh, Dolores? Yes, um, you know, last time we spoke to Joe about the process and uh, the idea was that um, there was some frustration about not enough time or ability to say, you know, for the public to, or for the community to really um, participate. We just had those 15 minute breakout sessions. And um, this last one was a surprise when we couldn't see the chat box, for example, or uh, it's kind of seemed to like go backwards. Well, who decided that um, that was the right thing to do? I mean, I guess you just want comments on it. Anyway, I found that disappointing and kind of. Uh, Surprising. To Laura's, you're mentioning specifically that they stopped using the chat box? For example, yes. And um, and I, once again, it's like uh, we were overwhelmed with facilitators and uh, didn't really get a chance to hear our, our fellow community members. Um, okay. That, that is, you found only a... To, let's say two or three members of the public in a typical breakout group. Yeah, and at least two facilitators, mm -hmm. but not everybody. Some some didn't have three participants. You know. Okay. Okay. Um, next, uh, JQ. Hi, JQ. Okay. Uh, sorry, I had trouble unmuting because the screen's still up. Anyway, um, my, my comments were pretty much the same as Dolores. Um, I just didn't think there was enough time for individuals to speak. There was just so much other stuff going on in setting up and the breakout sessions and everything else and also some problems with technical issues or whatever. But I think Greg had calculated even there was about 14 minutes total time for people to speak. And then if you had several people in, in your group, that didn't give you enough time to put to uh, really get your comments in. So uh, that was a major frustration. And the, also the fact there's just no sense of community participation in those meetings because you're just, it's almost like you're there by yourself in a call-in. So 
uh, I think that just takes away from from uh, the whole sense of due process, in my opinion. Thank you. Okay, so you, you're you're talking about the breakout groups as since they were just a few people and no crosstalk or even hearing it that that sort of undercuts your feeling of community participation <laughs> even more than the virtual meetings themselves. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else, JQ? Uh, that's not quite right. What you put there, breakout groups had too few people. No, it's the fact that that it was maybe the fact that not nobody had enough time to speak. No individual had enough time to speak. Okay. I'll correct that. Thank you. I think perhaps fewer people in the group would have given more time for individual, but that the whole thing was just set up inappropriately, in my opinion, to allow for for community input and a sense of community in this behind this whole thing. Good enough. Um, Marsha, Marsha Yates. Yes, I have to agree with JQ. I feel like it's a divide and conquer situation rather than getting the community together as one big group. Okay. So again, that's especially just about to have all of the discussions done in the larger group. Uh, yeah, and I think that we can't make these major decisions doing this uh, all this virtually. It's um, it's just it doesn't give you a feeling of camaraderie and really concern because it's just so impersonal. Even though we have videos and such, it's it's something that's going to affect our lives for the next you know thirty years and the construction and all of this stuff. It's really important that people feel like they can come and voice their opinion as opposed to being having to be technically challenged by being able to turn on and off your mic and such. I just, just think it's, these decisions are too important to make so impersonally. Okay, so with, with the discussion, even within this uh, meeting of the MCC and discussion there, um, it seems to me it's about the same level we have when the public is, is present in a large meeting, that is in terms of speaking time. Um, does that uh, meet some of your criteria? Yeah, just have to see how it works. Okay. Um, no, next I just, Go ahead. I feel like we can, this way it's an interesting format, but I really don't feel connected, you know? And I think these decisions, you have to feel connected and to make really big decisions that are gonna affect a whole lot of people's lives for a really long time. Okay. Um, Michelle Dragony. Uh, hi. Um, so there were 50 people that showed up to the Montero Water District meeting and it was completely open-faced and it was brilliant because it was a four hour meeting. It was, it, it, it was intense because they wanted to impose a $558 property tax on keeping their water system you know, resilient. And it was emotional, it was intellectually challenging, but at the end of the four and a half hours, Everybody understood how complicated the Montero water system is. There's 13 lift pumps, 33 grinder pumps. They might get their water for free through Alta Vista, et cetera, but they have to pay for a lot of infrastructure to get that to happen. And so in the end, there were only 33 people that were like um, hardship. And there was a guy online that said, you know, I'm rich, I'll pay for you guys. So with a 50 person attendance, they solved their problem. What CTC is doing with the way, and I have talked to Katie uh, Faulkner uh, for at least two hours over the last few months, as an instructional designer, by courting people into small rooms where they can't see what each other is saying is disingenuous in terms of communication. I asked two or three times of Katie, just open it up. But 
Uh, I know Claire would like to open it up and I hope we can. And let's have like five or six meetings where we have a full attendance of, of all the people that are interested in this. And I will help drive people to the meeting as long as it's completely open. Right now, it's we've got like what, 15, 25 people online. That's not bad. I mean, as an MCC meeting, that's not bad. But we can do better if we get to the CTC audience that we need to get to. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. When you mentioned face-to-face -face at the MWSD, did more people just uh, put their live face there? Or was that just an oh, expression? Yeah. I mean, it was it was a 4,000% increase of, of attendance for any Montero meeting in history. No, no, I'm, and, I'm talking about actually showing yourself on the camera. Pardon? I'm talking well, about showing yeah, yourself some, on the camera. Some people did, but some people just like, you know, they just put their name up there. Um, and that's okay too. I mean, you don't necessarily have to have your face on the camera. Mm -hmm. I understand. And in fact, I would say that a lot of people prefer not to have their face. I mean, I don't really like to be on camera myself. <laughs> I'm not part of the board, so I don't need to. Um, I was yesterday. Um, but um, I think people like to attend and they like to lurk. They like to listen. They like to learn. And it makes them think. And uh, coming to a meeting is way more complicated for people who are in their 20s to 40s when they have kids. But there's a, a, a person on the CUSD board and she does not come on camera because she's got to put her kid to bed in between the meeting. So I think, I think the, the, the remote thing is, it's a bit difficult to get at, at the beginning, but I think it will eventually um, allow more people to attend and be involved. Okay, thank you. Uh, JQ, your hand is still up. Did you have another comment? I guess JQ's hand. I think I forgot to lower it. I've been lowering okay. people's hands. Got it. Uh, Kimberly Williams. Hi, I just wanted to note two things from the last meeting. And that was that one person in my group was never able to speak. Um, he couldn't figure out how to unmute himself, so they just went on without him. And so in that way, all people weren't heard. And then um, the other thing was in the report outs, and this was mentioned for the first and the second set of meetings, the facilitators often skipped over some important points made by people. And I'm not talking necessarily about my own points made um, and did not report those out. And I'm and I did not see those recorded in the first two meetings. I'm not sure about the third meeting. I haven't looked at that yet since it was just um, released, but I guess that seems to me problematic that some things are left out um, in terms of feedback. And I, and I guess a, a follow-on question to that would be, if there are significant comments left out from participants, is there an opportunity, you know, aside from the surveys to be, to, for those to be pointed out and added back in, or are they just going by the, the surveys that are sent out afterwards? Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Dolores. Hi, yes, I had, I meant to ask this earlier. When you say there were 132 participants, does that in, exclude uh, elected people and uh, facilitators and all? That wasn't quite clear to me. Um, I don't know if Joe can answer that, but by my counts, Dolores, yes, that did exclude them. Uh, and as Joe said earlier, that's not really 132 separate people. It was yes. 132 non-facilitator uh, uh, that participated over other sessions, but they might have been uh, redundant. I mean, redundant or yeah, oh, yeah. same people. Okay. Joe, did you? Want to know, to it would be nice to, to know how them? many of the how many different people were there. About one hundred. That's one hundred unique people, Joe. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's all I see here. Uh, anyone on the council wish to speak on this point? Yes. Claire? 
Um, just to echo uh, what uh, Kimberly said, I, I, in the group that I observed in the final meeting, there were some local people in the group who were extremely knowledgeable about the situation and had some very concrete and specific um, suggestions which were not captured because I, I think that the person doing the notes wasn't really familiar with what they were describing. And I do think that's a problem. Um, it's hard to know what, what should have been done about it, but it was certainly something that I felt was a lack. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Glenn? We'll, yes? Uh, I'd like to comment. Uh, I didn't see your hand up. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to uh, say that I agree with a lot of the concerns that have been already brought up. And uh, I'd like to go a little further, and I'd like to make the statement that I do not believe that um, these virtual meetings were uh, public enough. Um, uh, I don't believe they were sufficiently publicized, number one. And um, uh, the public participation was not allowed to be robust. Um, specifically in the breakout rooms. Um, I'm not hearing what other people are saying. Uh, I'm going from the Moss Beach meeting into the El Granada meeting, and I don't, I don't know what people are saying in, El, in, in Moss Beach. The uh, transcripts were not available. Um, so I didn't have that information um, as, as you know, the concerns of, of people in uh, Moss Beach, which, you know, would also apply, often apply um, just down the, just down the highway. Um, also, it was very, very concerning that none of the background information that I think was, believe it was uh, Dolores that brought up, all of the past meetings, um, it was like that was all to go to the wayside. Nothing from the past meetings, all the money that was spent by the county and the personal time that was invested by community members uh, in the past um, meetings, they just were not mentioned. It was like it was all erased. And I think that's very... Um, it's very concerning, um, very sad, uh, because uh, there's a lot of a lot of tax dollars being spent here. Um, you know, I'm concerned my future that um, you know taxes are gonna you know really really put a put a, uh, a cost on me. Um, you know, living here, m moving forward, property taxes, everything. Um, I am, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned. It's just really, uh, unacceptable to, to me that all the tax dollars being spent on this and it's not being, uh, at least from my point of view, it's, it's not being used efficiently. It's not being, uh, it's almost like, um, there's somebody behind the curtain that's trying to get their way. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy about that. Okay, thank you, Dan. Okay, Dave? Uh, yeah, so I, I've said most of my comments in other meetings, but um, I, I do wanna say um, that I'm very happy we are going to have a single community meeting. Everybody who wants to can attend, hear each other, um, speak to each other. Um, uh, the first series of Connect the Coast Side meetings, um, I had uh, quite a few personal problems with the way those were run. I'm not surprised that not much of the feedback from them made it into anything because it was very chaotic. Um, the MCC had offered to help run these meetings this time around, and um, that was not picked up. So. Um, 
doing it on our own, I think is quite appropriate. That's it. Okay. So uh, moving on to the, uh, the third item on the agenda, as Dave mentioned, before uh, the, the joint meeting we are scheduled to have with the planning commission, or, I'm sorry, the planning department and the people working on the studies on the county side on July 10th, we have windows where we could hold up to three special meetings on Wednesdays. Our next regular meeting is on the uh, 22nd of July, the 24th of July, uh, 22nd. And but, but between there and the 10th, there are about three, three meeting openings. And so uh, f for those, for one of those, uh, I looked at trying to emphasize what I would call sort of the, the core content of models and technology that, that drives the, the particulars of the comprehensive transportation management plan. You know, things like the measurements used, how that data is collected, the land use, the build out, as well as we need to have a, a level of uh, coordination with the city of Half Moon Bay. I did have the opportunity to ask Coastal Commission staff about that since they're both both running LCP processes in parallel. And uh, from the commission standpoint, they don't drive those two. So their comment is that they would look for the, uh, the two, the entities to, uh, to connect, to reach out to each other. So for one of our meetings, I'm certainly gonna make an effort to ask involvement of Half Moon Bay on some of the particulars. I, this, the second focus for the, our meetings would be more at the project level. So what I'm trying to do is, is divide them up. So if you wanna know more about the delay index or the data, land use and build out, things like that, that we can dive into that. Uh, Joe has said his uh, group would prepare a white paper on build out, both build out to 2040 and beyond. So that'll be available. And some of it falls to us to look at things that are already out there. Uh, I think the MCC website has virtually every document that's out there, even the ones that Joe talked about today. But the question still to us is how can we organize it, given good participation, to have a good, a good process and bring that to a point. So to that end, especially for some of the people who talked here today, I may reach out to you in the next day or two for thoughts about how to do that. I think we have the, the tool is going to be a virtual meeting. It's going to be a single meeting for everyone present. And as I said, the, the thoughts I put in at first is really to look at some of, I might call them some of the technical particulars. And the second one would be more on the projects. I'm open to any comments people from the public have relative to, to framing those, because we have to put out our agenda for that meeting this weekend. And uh, feel free to reach out to me privately as well. Anybody on the council have any comments they want to make on this at this point? Okay, then at this, <clears throat> this point, then we'll move on from this topic to council activity. Any correspondence or meetings attended people would like to share? Yes. Uh, I'm continuing to attend the COVID briefings uh, weekly. Um, and I can give more information on that if anybody wants it. I also attended the Attorney General's hearing on the prospective sale of Seton and Seton Coastside. Uh, comment was unanimously in favor of uh, a pending sale to, I believe it's AHMC, uh, who is committed to maintaining uh, most of the current services for uh, at least five years. So hopefully that will work out to everybody's satisfaction. Anyone else with comments? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so I just spoke to uh, oh, one, one thing on future agendas I want to mention. We will cover on the 22nd our treasurer's report. Uh, I also want to acknowledge that the treasurer's report was due for this meeting and uh, I did not get it on the agenda. That was my fault, but we will close on that item on our July 22nd meeting. Uh, 
I have plans for a July 15th meeting. Uh, Dave and Claire have been the other two people working with me on agenda planning. And so it will be up to us to review what we've seen here tonight, sort of to talk to ourselves to determine what and whether we can put forward an agenda for that meeting. And again, invite anybody from the public who has particular thoughts and quite a few were shared here tonight, which we've made note of to make that successful. Um, I'll also reach out to Planning Commission staff more for input. There's not their meeting. Certainly some may attend and observe. Um, and Joe's already indicated a couple of studies where he'll try to get information to us. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing further, we accept a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.